Hinkle. So I'm excited to be on here with y'all tonight. So I'm just going to start kind of telling y'all my story and my journey because I know some of you may not know it. I'm one of your diamond uplines with Plexus. And I started this business four years ago and I started it solely for the business. I really didn't even know what the products were and I just jumped in with both feet because my best friend started it first and I'm a numbers girl and I looked at the compensation and it looked amazing. And I caught the vision very early when I read that compensation plan. I thought, Oh my gosh, this is so much better than anything I've ever seen because I've been with other direct sales and I, I had this feeling that I could achieve this. Um, it's a very doable compensation plan. And uh, if there were these, the one I was with before, the top rank, they're a shutdown business now. They don't even exist. It was vaulted. And so I don't mind saying it. They went into foreclosure. But, um, the top rank had to maintain like 3,500 PV in personal sales just to keep the rank. And we were selling jeans. So $3,500 in jeans a month. So when I saw all I had to have was $100 in sales a month, I was like, oh, I am in. This is fantastic. So, so I jumped in with both feet and my goal was to make enough to pay for our groceries. And by my third month in, I had lost 10 pounds and I felt amazing. So I'm like, I believe in the products now. This is, this is awesome. And I had already reached that goal. And so being able to see like a financial change so quickly was, was such a big believer in me from the get go of, of what we have here with Lexus. And so it's just, it was such a, a whirlwind of a journey for me. I, I hit Emerald in 10 months. Um, and then I hit Sapphire a few months later and then I stalled out Sapphire for a full year. And it was probably the best thing for my business to have that year of growth and learning and it, it, it was it, it was very it was very good for me to have that personal growth and then my husband and I hit diamond together the same month of May two years ago and so that is that's kind of my journey in a nutshell but um, I'm happy to be on here with y'all tonight and kind of sharing with y'all a little bit I wanted to talk to y'all about mindset and getting out of your comfort zone now, I know Amy has talked to all of y'all about your why. Why are you here? What is motivating you? What is the end goal you want to see? Now, I think that's, that's the easy part. It's easy for us to create our whys and dream about them happening and put it on a dream board, which is great. But are you really and truly believing that you're going to achieve that why? Do you believe in your heart of hearts this is happening? Or do you doubt yourself? And even more so, are you doing everything it possibly takes to make it happen? When your comfort is more important to you than your why, despair is coming. Now, I want to kind of stop on that for just a second. Because personally, I'm a huge fan of comfort. A cozy couch and some good TV and a bag of popcorn is like perfection for me. Um... And I love the easy luxuries in life. Like I have my groceries delivered. I got Amazon Prime. Like I, I just, I really do love comfort. But if you're letting everyday comfort sneak in and steal your vision, that's where there's a problem. I'm reading this book right now by Jenny Allen. It's called Nothing to Prove. And there is a quote in here I wanted to read to y'all. Um, it's a Christian book, so hopefully it doesn't offend any of you. But it's really, that's not what it's applying to. So she said, so... If I were your enemy, I would make you numb and distract you from God's story. Technology, social media, Netflix, travel, food and wine, comfort. I would not tempt you with notably bad things, or you would get suspicious. I would distract you with everyday comforts that slow, slowly feed you a different story and make you forget God. And I think this is so applicable to just more than our faith, but it the comforts also make us forget our mission and they make us forget our why because you just get so wrapped up in that. And so I want to repeat what I said. When your comfort is more important to you than your why, despair is coming. So the first thing I want to ask y'all tonight is your why a higher priority to you than your comfort? And are you acting that out? Can you physically show that you're placing your why ahead of your own comforts? 
And this doesn't mean that there'll be no comforts in your life and things will, some things won't be easy. But in order to really achieve what you want to achieve, you can't place that first. So to create, to create something meaningful and achieve your why, you're going to have to take risks. You have to be uncomfortable. Complacency has never led to the creation of anything. And because of this, you're also going to have critics. And if you don't have critics, you're probably doing something wrong. I've always heard people say in Plexus, um, the people at the top are there because they got the most no's. Well, we also have the most critics. Um, it's not just the most no's. And the critic isn't what's dangerous. It's letting the critic's opinion matter. This is why the man in the arena quote by Theodore Roosevelt is like my all time favorite quote. If you've ever been on a call I've done, I probably have already read it to you. Um, but I'm going to read it to y'all again. because It's my all time favorite. But he said, it's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best, in the end, knows the triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. So it's not the critic who counts. And that's such an easy thing to say. And it's so easy for us to say, I'm not going to let people's opinions matter. And, and I'm not going to place importance on that. But in reality, how hard is that to actually put into practice? Um, and I know for some of you, you might be more thick skinned and you know, you can let it roll off and it doesn't really bother you. But then there's others like me, I'm a very yellow personality and I, I, I really do care what other people think. And it really, really does get to me. And so this is a hard thing. And I can memorize that quote and repeat it a hundred times a day and hang it in my entryway. But when I face a critic, my first response is still going to be instantly to shut down. So how do we move past that so that we can do things daring and uncomfortable and face the critic because they're going to be there if you step out step out of your comfort zone and how do we not only let it not hurt our feelings but not rock our actual beliefs that's the part that's more important you can recover from hurt feelings but you can't recover from from your belief being rocked that way well, you can but that's the harder part to recover from so I do believe, honestly, this is one of the secrets that sets the people at the top apart from the people who quit or are stuck. It's they, they have found this ability to move past the critic. And I believe one of the answers to this, at least for me that I have found, it lies in the self-talk that you're saying to yourself in those moments of failure and criticism. And it tends to be one of two things. When you're, faced with, when you're faced with failure or with criticism, you tend to respond one of two ways, and it's either with guilt or with shame. Guilt and shame are two very vastly different emotions. Guilt says, I did something bad. Shame says, I am bad. So let's say you set a goal up, and you didn't work as hard as you meant to that month, and you ended up missing that goal, because you had something the end of the month that night planned, and you just, you just didn't show up that much. And guilt would say, darn it, I missed the goal. I, I binge watched in a whole season of This Is Us, and I went out with my girls on the 31st, and I, I hate it that I did that, but next month, I'm all in. I'm changing, and this is what I'm gonna do, and I write out a strategy, and I, and I, make, it, and I make a change. Where if you're having that shame self-talk, shame's going to say, I was so lazy. I'm such a slacker. I'm so mad at myself. I have no influence. I don't deserve this. And that is the self-talk we have to get rid of. Let's say you got criticized for making a post on Facebook that came across spammy. Um, and the critic, you know, responds and like, is this really you? This seems like spam. You know, guilt would say, I really need to work on my social media presence. Who can I follow better to get ideas? Or shame would say, see, I knew I should have never done this. I'm such a fool. So I don't know about you guys, if y'all have ever had the shame talk. I know I definitely have. 
especially in moments where I've like failed my kids or something. And I'm like, I'm a horrible mom, I'm a horrible mom. Um, but shame is one of the most dangerous emotions. Um, there's been studies that show like addicts, like they can link shame to addicts. Like it's one of the biggest connectors. So we really need to focus on what you're saying to yourself in these moments of failure and face with criticism. So Brene Brown, she's one of my all time favorite authors. And she talks many times about how vulnerability is the arch enemy of shame. So shame loves secrecy. It wants to stay inside. It wants you to keep your failure inside. It doesn't want you to expose anything. It wants you to put on this air. Um, so anytime you start to think I'm a failure, I want you to challenge you to find an accountability partner who is in that arena with you that you can open up to and share what you did that made you have those feelings. Now, this isn't someone to go to and say, I'm a failure to, this is someone to go to and say, I didn't meet my goals this month because I did this, this, and this, you know, I watched too much TV. I went out with my friends too much. I just chose not to work because I didn't feel like it. And that's why I didn't hit my goal and use that partner, use that person as accountability. And then you can use constructive criticism to come up with better ways, actually fix what you did. So next month we don't do that. Um, you have to be very intentional about shutting shame down in its tracks. Um, it, and it's not something you can do alone. I know I, I have in my past even thought, you know, I'm just going to quit talking to myself like this. I'm just going to quit saying this. It truly is not something you can do alone. You truly have to be vulnerable with another person. And, um, I wish I could remember what she said. There was one talk I listened to with Brene Brown and she said one of the lies of vulnerability is that you can be vulnerability, by, you can be vulnerable by yourself <laughs> and you can tell yourself I can be vulnerable to myself <laughs> but there's no vulnerability in that. So, so you have to find somebody that you can, that you can be vulnerable with in a very positive and safe and constructive environment um, so that you can get past the shame talk. And, and this will actually create that change when you're faced with a critic and when you're faced with hard times instead of letting it defeat you. So the second thing I want to ask you tonight, does your self-talk consist of guilt or shame? And what are you going to do to change that? And then the last thing I wanted to ask you guys tonight is do you really, really, truly believe that you're going to go diamond one day? And when you write down your why, and think about your future. Are you honestly believing you can do this? Or is there any doubt in the back of your mind saying, I'm not really gonna be there, it's a pipe dream. Um, you can't listen to that doubt. You have to get it out. Cause there's, there's even a glimmer of doubt telling you that the highest rank you're ever gonna get to is silver. You're gonna work your business like a silver ambassador. But if you believe wholeheartedly, you will get to diamond, you will work it like a diamond, you'll get there. So show up, get uncomfortable, don't speak shame over yourself, work hard and with grit and believe wholeheartedly that you'll make it to the top and, and you'll be here with me one day, guys. I fully believe that. So that was short, but that's all I got. That's all I put together for y'all. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think that is so important, especially not only just mindset, but I love what you talked about that. I know I do the same thing. I mean, we all do it probably as moms, but I do it as a leader for the team all of the time. Um, and I think I'm having my aha growth moment here. You talked about being stuck at Sapphire for a year. Um, so yeah, I, this definitely hit home and I, I'm sure it did with a lot of people too on the team. And I'm going to write your quote down. What you said is if you only think you're going to be silver, then you're going to work it like a silver ambassador. And then you're always going to be silver. I think that's great. Um, can you take a couple questions if anybody has some questions? All right. Does anybody have any questions for Nikki? Now's your chance, guys. You can unmute yourselves or you can chat it in. And Nikki, you, what were you doing before Plexus? You had, you were doing currently in that other company or you I were? Was, I, well, okay. I was doing a lot of things. I was a postpartum doula. I was a math tutor. Okay. I ordered things for people and I was a consultant with Vault Denim. So I had <laughs> okay, so all kinds of. To try to make an extra dollar. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions, you guys? No? Well, everybody's being quiet. I'd be like racking your brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, if y'all think of anything, like feel free to message me anytime. So, all right. Well, I have a question real quick. Yeah. yeah. 
Sorry, I was trying to figure out how to unmute. This is Holly. Hi, Amy. Um, I have a, <clears throat> Amy kind of knows my dilemma here. Um, I'm a single mom working full time as a nurse, as a hospice nurse, and I'm at least trying to fit my business into this. How do you make time to do both plus do everything else that you have to do? Right. <sighs> It can be fit into the next phase of your life. You hear that said. It truly can. But at the same time, it has to be a little bit more than that. Okay. Uh, I think the best thing to do is you can work Plexus alongside your nursing business. You have a network of people that you're with. I know you're not going to be able to necessarily bring it up to your customer or to your people that come in there. But to the oh, no, we do. I do. Oh, you do. Okay, well, great. <laughs> I wasn't sure your boundaries there. Right. But yeah, so it's something that is, it, for Plexus, it's something that is part of our lives that you do while you do the other things. Mm -hmm. So I'm selling Plexus while I'm with my kids at the park and while I'm at the school line and while I'm in, so it's not a separate, I have to sell Plexus and I have to be a mom and I have to be a nurse. Uh-huh. You're those things and you're selling Plexus while you're doing all those things too. Mm -hmm. So okay. just, just remember, you're constantly planting those seeds while you're out and then as your team builds while uh -huh. you're working your job i would just do a really good job of um of, of doing some delegations you know letting them know you know building leaders early so that they're not strongly relying on you you know having them you know run their meetings and having them spread their wings quickly because the, the faster they can feel like they have ownership of their business and they they feel empowered to do this the, the faster you're going to see them move up too because i mean we're all running our own businesses and so empower your your people as soon as they get on they can do this without you so that you're not feeling like you're having to do the bulk of the work in that aspect since you're still having your other full-time job well as far as the aspect of pulling all the bulk i am <laughs> right now because two of my um uh, ambassadors under me were sister-in-laws and when my husband passed they totally dropped off and then one was a good friend of mine that just wasn't seeing the results and she dropped off, which I'm still working with, but I'm kind of starting over again. Yeah. You know, and that, I think that'll happen too, but especially in the beginning, it's all about, you know, we talk a lot now about business builders and working the business and we have all these team calls and groups, but for me, I mean, I got to senior gold just on wholesalers. I had one person who was working the business uh -huh. um, that made me get there quicker, but really in the beginning, and Nikki, tell me if I'm wrong, you really are just talking to as many people about Plexus as you can. I mean, that is the goal, is just to get as many people as customers and ambassadors to build your business. And, you know, quicker you can do that, because we always talk about success, love, speed, um, then the quicker your business is going to build. And it was the same for me. It was about seeing your goal whenever I got another person that really wanted the business with me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's pretty average. So, okay, uh, thank you. So you're welcome. Someone else asked, she said, My issue is I'm totally disorganized and just can't keep, seem to keep up. Um, I don't block time. I, I do have this issue too. I, I really am. <laughs> I can be, I, I'm more of a creative personality, even though it confuses people because I have a degree in math. I'm a numbers girl, but I really am more of the creative side too with my. You should see my desk right now. I always show you, but it's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I, but so I, I get that, and I also hate the idea of a schedule. Like I don't want a job. <laughs> like this is not a job. So I won't set hours. But what I do to keep myself from from getting distracted when I do to do my work, and anytime I sit down, I'll sit down and see what I need to do. Like, like tonight, I had to write my notes for my meeting. So when I sat down, I looked at the clock and I'm like, work. it's five o'clock. I'm going to work from five to six just on that. So I shut down Facebook. I don't look at anything else from that time period. That's all I work on. When I'm doing follow-ups with customers, I'll, I'll sit down 30 minutes, follow-ups, only follow-ups. <laughs> and if I, and I, 
set a timer so I don't get distracted. So try doing blocking like that. So that, that can kind of keep you focused because it's so easy when we work a business that's on social media to get distracted by social media and we don't want to let that happen. Yeah. And you know, I love that tip because I also am the type, if I feel like I have too much to do, in fact, my husband just told me again tonight, if I have too much to do in my head, even though maybe it only take me an hour to do it all, I shut down and don't do anything. So really, if I say, okay, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to focus on follow up, then it's done. Um, so yeah, that's a great tip to do that time blocking. Anybody else have any questions for Nikki? She also, I don't know if she told you she's a mom of four kiddos. She's got a set of twins. Yeah. Um, and like she said, her husband's also a diamond. He was a former pilot, right? And he's retiring now. So, all right, guys. Well, thank you.